This is Dustin with Dustin's Dollars. Today, we're going to be talking about Tellurian, specifically about trying to value Tellurian as just a natural gas producer and ignoring the impact of driftwood. So um, before I begin, let me remind you that I am not a financial advisor or a financial professional of any sort. All opinions that I express in this video are mine and do not represent those of any company or any other individual. I currently hold a long position in Tellurian, so this video should be for your entertainment purposes only. Because I could be wrong about everything I say in this video, you need to do your own research before making any investment decisions. Um, hopefully today I'm able to go through some uh, you know, models that will help you think about uh, Tellurian uh, going forward as um, sort of a base case valuation. So, and I would also just say, if you are just here for the, you know, you just want the the bottom line, just the, you know, the rough conclusion, I'll go ahead and give that to you. Um, this is kind of the end, the, the end of this, and I'm gonna walk through what this all means, but these are roughly, you know, each bar here is one data point using one comparable company and one method to get a potential share price, um, what I consider fair valuation, right, in terms of share price for Tellurian. You can see this ranges somewhere between, you know, some some methods take a look at this and say that the fair value is somewhere between, you know, 50 cents and a dollar. Others go up, you know, two to three dollars. Some of the, the high points even going up to like four dollars per share, just valuing Tellurian as a natural gas producer. So if that's all you're here for. You just want to kind of the numbers, that's it. But, you know, I'm going to walk through this and tell you why I think, um, you know, these are credible uh, ways to come out of valuation for Tellurian. So I'm going to go ahead and get that started in earnest right now. So, um, hi, Wakaza. Uh, thanks for joining the stream. And hi, Brian. Um, thanks for joining the stream. And Transient Stacker. Hey, we're uh, hopping on. Um, nice to see y'all. Nice to see y'all back. Um, love, love to see you. So um, I am going to, uh, again, just to recap, I'm going to be trying to value Tellurian today, ignoring Driftwood, right? And Hopefully, you know, just for the quick recap for anybody who's been under a rock and uh, hasn't noticed, um, you know, didn't see what happened on, on Friday, as I'm, I'm pretty sure most people did. Most people probably had a bit of a heart attack somewhere around here, around uh, 11 a.m. Um, Eastern time. The They canceled their sales and purchase agreements, two of the three that they had, um, basically walking back, you know, the progress that walking back where we thought we were with Driftwood. Um, you know, where we thought we'd been for a year at this point, basically. And, you know, so at this point, I, I think the market is, uh, in my opinion, the market is not giving a whole lot of credence to Driftwood. And I think that's actually a good way to view this going forward um, in terms of base case and sort of some you know downside protection for your stock here is, or for your investment is to say, um, you know, Tellurian, is not just a business plan on paper. It's not just Driftwood. They are actually producing gas, and we can assign value to that because they are. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't think they were technically profitable. I think they were roughly break even last quarter. But I think you know going forward, it's fairly clear that they're going to. They, they at least could be profitable if they stopped. Uh, you know, investing money in further, um, further gas operations or into Driftwood itself. So I think we're going to try to value that. And to to be clear, I am ignoring today for the valuation part both the value of driftwood as an asset and also any money that they are putting into driftwood right so if i talk about you know ebitda for for 2023 um that is assuming that they actually have that, that they i guess ebitda might exclude but like if i talk about any sort of earnings right i'm i'm ignoring the fact that they might be dumping every cent that they have into driftwood to move things along in some form or fashion so Again, today, just assuming they were, you know, that they sort of rode off Driftwood. I don't think that that's going to happen. But again, I think this is a way to start to look at it for downside protection. All right. So I will move on and talk about the three methods that I am going to go through today. And you could agree or disagree. But this is kind of a couple ways I thought about being able to value Tellurian. One of them is just sort of a, a relative valuation. Sorry, I should actually state that up front. I am doing all of these as a relative valuation against other companies um, that I picked as sort of comparables. And I will I will go through just in a second what those companies are and why I, why I decided to pick those. Um, but I'm, I'm using three methods to compare each of these companies against Tilleran. I'm using the sort of current uh, you know production capacity of the companies. I'm looking at the current, um, sorry, and not, not just the production capacity, the, the enterprise value versus the production capacity. I'm looking at the enterprise value versus their proved reserves. And then I also have another number for Tellurian because there's a 
huge discrepancy between their proved reserves and their um, sort of total estimated reserves. Other companies don't have quite that large of, of, uh, of a discrepancy. I'll, I'll go through that in a moment. Um, and then I'm also going to be looking at their 2022 uh, EBITDA versus the current enterprise value of these companies. So um, hi, Greg. Uh, thanks for joining the stream. And, uh, you know, Greg says, thank you for doing this. You're absolutely welcome. Uh, hopefully you get some value out of this. So going through the companies real quick, just so you know which companies I picked, they are listed right here. Hopefully you can read those. They are um, CNX Resources, Comstock, uh, Range Resources, Southwestern Energy, and Antero Resources. And I picked these companies, you know, because they were, they're not some of the huge, huge producers. Um, you know, they're on the smaller side, you know, they're still all larger than Tellurian. And because as far as I could tell, and again, I'm, I'm actually not an expert in sort of any of these companies. I, I tried to go out and, and do do the research as quickly as I could. So I could have gotten things wrong. But um, as far as I can tell, these are the companies that are primarily gas producers, right? There's a bunch of other energy companies that might be closer in some aspects of Tellurian, but are actually, uh, you know, produce a lot of oil alongside their gas. And I think that's a, a different enough industry um, that I didn't think it was quite a great comparable. So these are the companies I picked. And, you know, just a couple caveats to keep in mind here. All the numbers here I gathered manually, you know, so I could have gotten something wrong, right? I was looking at 10 Qs, 10 Ks, press releases, investor presentations, all that stuff. So I tried to gather all that data myself. Um, and, you know, another one is, you know, a lot a lot of these actually aren't operating the same geographic area as hell, right? They're not down in the Haynesville. Um, and so, you know, that's going to cause some differences here. But again, I had to work with what I had. Um, all these companies do have debt. Uh, you know, sort of a good chunk of debt, whereas Tellurian actually has a net cash, you know, positive cash position. And so that is one thing that, you know, you could maybe say would uh, skew some of these results. But again, I am going to be using enterprise value here to try to offset that, right, where I'm looking at the total value of these companies. Um, and in Tellurian's case, it actually makes sort of the, the what the market cap, it has to subtract out the, the net cash position. Whereas for these folks, I'd have to add back in the debt. Um, and... Another big thing is I did not look at the impact of each company's uh, sort of hedging strategies. I, I just sort of looked at things in broad gas market um, terms. I did not look at how each company decides to hedge their, their production because that could actually make a material difference. But it's just it's a lot of it's a lot of, of digging in and, and reading and looking you know deep in the numbers to kind of understand that. All right. So that is the uh, sort of setup for this. All right. So the first valuation method that I had was looking at the current production, sorry, actually uh, the end of Q2 2022 production capabilities for each of these companies. And this is in, um, you know, million cubic feet uh, of gas equivalent per day in terms of production rate. And I have those numbers listed here for, um, for each of these companies. And this uh, is... You know, th these are all larger than Tellurian, right? For for reference, Tellurian is expecting at the sorry uh, is expecting at the end of this year to be at 250 um, mm CFE per day, and I'm using that number now and further down where I do use Tellurian, uh, try to value Tellurian here because they're they're very uh, sort of imminently going to reach that number if you if you believe management, um, which I think is I think it's fairly credible, right, in terms of the gas production uh, of what they're going to do over the next you know, four months. Um, I think that's more straightforward than maybe something else you might, uh, you might quibble about uh, the the confidence we could have in what management says for, you know, getting financing or something. Um, but in terms of the gas production, that I think is fairly credible. And I use that number because Tellurin is growing their operations massively, whereas these other companies are much more mature. They're growing at like 10% per year, not like you know, Tellurian is growing, I think, more than 10% per quarter at this point. So um, I, I'm using their year end numbers, assuming that the market is going to be at least a little bit forward looking on that. Um, I mean, if you look forward even another year, then the numbers even get even uh, higher. So um, that's valuation method number one. And so what I did here was I, I have their actual production numbers for each company I have both their market cap and their current debt. Um, again, at the end of Q2. And these market cap numbers, I believe, were as of the end of day Friday. Um, and you, you get those numbers, add that up to get the enterprise value, divide out by their production. And this right here is sort of the dollar enterprise value the market is assigning per unit of production. And so if we then multiply by Tellurian's production, we'll get sort of a rough projection of how, you know, just a comparable valuation versus these companies for Tellurian. 
And so if I go down here and look at the actual numbers, what does that look like um, for a potential enterprise value for Tellurian for each one of these companies based off of that method? You could get these amounts of enterprise value, right? These are in millions. So you're talking, you know, 800 million, maybe a low, low estimate of 625 million, all the way up to, you know, 1.1 billion in terms of current valuation, enterprise value. And, uh, you know, because Tellurian actually has a net cash position, right? That would mean that they're market cap would be even lower. Is that right? Yeah, or sorry, higher. Um, Sorry, I, I got did it wrong in my head. I have it right on the spreadsheet here where their market cap is even higher because you would have to subtract out that cash to get to their enterprise value. And so based off of that, that would get us to market caps of, you know, this sort of this range here, somewhere between 770 to roughly $1,300 million. And then in terms of share price by that method, this would get us to somewhere between a buck 36 to 228. Again, just um, valuing them based off of their 2022 year end production capacity. And um, so that is that is one way that I have to value this. Moving on to the, the second method. The second method here is trying to value their their them by their proved reserves, right? How much actual gas do they have as an asset, right? So this is a little bit different than production. This is just, you know, total how much gas do they have? You know, something closer to like, book value, but it's book value of the actual underlying assets they're going to be selling as opposed to necessarily the equipment, which you know, the equipment only has, it's, in my opinion, the equipment only really has value insofar as it's going to extract the resources and be able to sell them, um, you know, at a higher price. So I think valuing the underlying gas uh, reserves is actually meaningful. Um, one thing to note, or I, I guess I'll go through that in a second, but I also uh, grabbed each of these companies proved reserves. And this is not this is not their total reserves, including you know things that they haven't proven yet. Um, this is this is their actual proved reserves and uh, trillion cubic feet equivalent. And you know so this ranges for these companies anywhere between six up uh, all the way up to twenty one trillion cubic feet equivalent. And uh, you know this is a lot more than Tellurian. Tellurian has much much lower. I want to say their proved reserves were let me see four hundred sixteen BCF right. So point point four uh, trillion cubic feet equivalent. And so, you know, if I divide out by their enterprise value by the proved reserves, we get a range that looks like this. You multiply by Tolerian's proved reserves of 416 BCF. Um, that was kind of, I think, a, I think an estimate that I got based off of what they had last reported and how much I believe they've acquired from Insight, but then also consumed in terms of, you know, their production they've had for, for Q1, Q2, and estimated for Q3. I think that's where I came up with this number at. Um, you know, if, if, if you if you need more details, you know, ask me in the comments and I could probably uh, dig into that after the fact. So if I look at it from this perspective, this tends to be the this is the lowest valuation method of all the ones I looked at by far. Um, and I'm going to talk about this in just a second as to kind of uh, why I believe that is um, and how I would adjust how I adjust for it here. Um, so I think that gets us to a market cap here, multiplying out these numbers of, you know, somewhere around, uh, you know, 300 to just under six hundred um, million dollars. So obviously that's a very low valuation. Um, you know, in terms of, of share price, you know, that those are numbers that probably nobody here wants to see. Um and again, that is that is pretty low. And as I said, um I think that uh that's really a bad comparison for Tellurian. And the reason why is actually I'm gonna open up the presentation real quick and go to a particular slide, is that Tellurian has a large portion of their uh, resource right they have estimated over two trillion cubic feet of total resources and they've again they only have what's that like less than a quarter of those um in terms of actual proved reserves and so i kind of what i did here if you could read the footnote on what this thing is i can maybe zoom in here um you know, this is a management estimate of total reserves and contingent reserves, you know, as of August 1st. Um, and so I couldn't find similar numbers for other companies. What I did in order to kind of account for the fact that they really only are, are calling 20, less than 25% of these approved reserves is I, I just sort of split the difference and said, well, what if we, what if they are pretty close and, uh, you know, it's roughly half of that that is actually good gas. And then they, they end up getting 1.5 TCF in terms of proof reserved eventually. Um, 
what does that do to their price and the valuation here? And that actually gets us up to you know a, a, some of a, what of a similar range to the production. Um, if we do at least give them credit for some of that, since there's so much untapped uh, reserves in a way that other companies did not have, um, you know, so that comes down here and gets to these numbers here, which look, you know, closer to, uh, I think, a fair value for, for their assets here. Um, I see there are some questions. I, let me go through just my last method real quick uh, for valuation Then I, I would love to have, you know, all the chat in the world today. Um, I want to try to get through all of this uh, valuing as a natural gas producer. I have, I have one more method here, and that is based off of their um, their 2022 EBIT. Uh, it's actually EBIT, EBIT DAX. Um, as I was doing more research into the industry, it looks like this is kind of a standard number. I actually use the the adjusted EBIT DAX number that a lot of companies report. And so Tellurian might have some, some items you would actually subtract off that would pump up their numbers a bit. So maybe this is slightly conservative. Um, because I use the sort of pumped up numbers from other companies that they, uh, I allowed their adjustments. I didn't look into it too deeply. I just some, again, this is just a comparative valuation. I'm looking for some ballpark numbers here. Um, but if we look at each of these companies here, you can, I have a list out here, what their their Q2 EBITDAX numbers were. And then I just multiplied by four to annualize that. Um, and just to get sort of a point in time estimate here, because nobody really gave me an estimate for the full year. Um, so I just, apply the same methodology to each company hopefully that you know evens itself out there and then if i um compare this against tellurian at a 400 million dollar ebitda which is what they've projected for next year and i think they would be there for i think they'd be there for this year at the 250 million um uh, million cubic feet per day of production they are projecting to have in in just a couple of months at the end of the year and again, I'm using that as sort of an anchor point to value them because I think that's um, that reflects a lot of the very imminent growth that they're going to have in terms of the gas production. There's going to be a slower growth from there and require a lot more money. Um, but I think it's a credible number. I have a model that actually goes through and, and looks at uh, at the what 2022 would have been if they had 250 million uh, cubic feet per day of production, and it gets gets you to around 450 million of you know what would have been uh, EBITDA excluding the um, exploration expenses that, that, that that's what the x is and ebit dax if i didn't say that um so that is uh that gets you to you know these kind of of numbers in terms of uh in terms of valuation market cap adds a little more and then that gets you to stock prices that would be somewhere in the two to three dollar range you know maybe even up to um closer to four dollars depending on who you're looking at here uh, and, and then, um, you know, if you're looking even higher, I didn't update that number, but if I, if you're even looking at higher at 450 million, um, cause I think there's a credible, credible reason to believe that the, the numbers will be slightly better than 400 million EBITDA, uh, that get that pumps it up just a little more, but roughly 10% there, as you can see, and that gets your numbers in sort of the two to three, maybe even $4 range. Again, just valuing to Lorian, um, as their, as a natural gas producer. So. Those are sort of my valuations. I had a whole other spreadsheet here on um, that I went through to build up my EBITDA numbers, and I have an estimate for uh, sort of 2023 in terms of EBITDA. And I'm not going to go through this today because I actually think this took this took longer than I expected. I'm almost 20 minutes in, and I, I see there's a bunch on the chat. I want to go through it um, in, in just a moment. But if I look here, uh, just to give you the the bottom line, and maybe I'll go through this in a future video. Maybe I won't. Who knows? Um, I do think that their 2023 EBITDA is credible from, you know, gas prices as they exist right now. And from, um, you know, Tellurian had previously put out this 8K saying that they expected 400 million EBITDA. And, you know, gas prices today are even slightly higher than they were uh, at the time that they were using that. So I think 400, maybe a tiny bit more in terms of EBITDA for 2023 is, um, you know, is credible. Uh, assuming the gas prices from here don't continue falling, which is, you know, Hard to say, but again, this is using the futures prices for, for all of next year. So, you know, this is the best estimate that we have right now, I think, uh, to use. Um, all right, let me go back and scroll up on the chat because I see there's been a lot of talk. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. And um, let's talk through some of this stuff. Uh, all right. Um, Transient Stacker, I think that's the first one that I had not gotten to yet, says, do you think natural gas pr prices will go higher or lower in the USA? Um that is a very difficult question. I, I don't honestly know. Um, sorry. I, again, I, I am using the, I am using the, uh, you know, futures prices for each individual month. 
um, you know, from the actual uh, NYMEX strip prices here. Uh, you can get them on this website here, CME Group. I think that's our official website. Um, and this is my best estimate of numbers. I really don't have a strong opinion. Like I, I can see things, I can see factors either way, you know, but it's so hard to predict because there's going to be unknown unknowns or, or things that, you know, are right now are, are sort of binary events. And, and you know, the, the biggest one here would be biggest one here. I'm not going to say would be, could be right. What happens with Russia and Ukraine, right? That could make, if something happens and you know, that, that can make a big difference uh, in terms of some of the, you know, high demand for gas, you know, being exported and leaving the country. Um, you know, at the same time, it could also cause some crazy stuff if that escalates, right? And I think that would percolate through many different um, areas, including natural gas, including, you know, a whole, whole bunch of places. Um, you know, we could have more issues at some of the production plants, right? Some of the LNG export facilities that would cause, you know, sort of decrease the demand for gas. And then that would you know, obviously push the prices down, um, you know, I think some of those moves also get amplified because I think there's some, you know, trading going on in the system that is speculating on, uh, you know, things being tighter or, or looser, you know, in the future. I think some of this you might, it, hypothetically, let's say we see, uh, you know, one of the LNG facilities, you know, go forward and now this all are effectively firms up some, um, you know, demand. I, I guess maybe that would be for, further in the future. Maybe they wouldn't have an, an immediate impact. Um, I don't know. You know, you could see it, 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 there's, there's so many factors here, I, I think, um, you know, you could see a natural disaster and that could send prices go, you know, go sky high. So I think there's um, it, 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 the, the, I, I'm using the, the futures as my the, the best estimate that I have. Uh, you know, again, the market is is I'm relying on the market to have reasonable prices uh, estimates of the future there. But there's so many unknowns that we really can't do better than just using this, in, in my opinion. Um, sorry, I know that was a non a very long non answer for you. Uh, but I think I think natural gas prices are a really hard thing to um, predict. All right. Quincy Morris says, what reason do you do we have to think driftwood financing will happen in the next two years or so? Um, I'm, I'm also going to read what what Greg says. I think this is all related. He says, uh, I believe Tell had a hard time partnering with natural gas producers because their driftwood production capacity was all filled up three big contracts. And now that the two of the contracts have been canceled, this frees up their production capacity and they will find other natural gas producers to be partners to help fund driftwood. Um, I'm going to address those in, uh, you know, reverse order. And that that's definitely, you know, I, I think Greg, that is what their, um, that's what their press release implied on, on Friday for sure. Um, I'm a little skeptical of, of that, uh, you know, Personally, I, like, it's possible. I'm personally a little skeptical because, you know, clearly Shell canceled. Sorry, it was, it was Shell canceled the first one and then they, you know, Tellurian canceled the second contract. Um, but, I mean, they, they clearly wanted to go forward with what they had. Um, I'm guessing that the terms they're getting, it, the terms that they, the other folks want, right? The terms that the uh, natural gas producers want, is not what they had with Shell, you know, not not some of these things where where Tolorin is able to capture a good chunk of that spread, right? The reason why the natural gas producers want it is because they want to capture some of that spread, um, you know, plain and simple, right? I, I think that's uh, pretty clear. And so I'm a little skeptical that like, well, they couldn't, they, they couldn't, you know, make a deal with natural gas producers because they couldn't offer them enough, enough capacity. Like there may be a hint of that, but I think also it is that Tellurian didn't want to, as long as they have these sales and purchase agreements. And I think now is, it might be the first time that they're truly going to go negotiate with those folks in, um, you know, for, for real, right? Because now they kind of, they have more impetus to actually have to make a deal with them. Um, and they're, they're going to have to probably give up more. So let me, um, let me go back. Why won't it let me scroll up? There we go. Uh, what Quincy Morris had said, what reason do you ha do we have to think driftwood financing will happen in the next two years or so? I mean, it's a good question. Um, and I, I have no particular answer uh, for you right now, unfortunately, right? I think this is, I can make a good argument either way, right? The, the easiest, sorry, I'll, I'll say a couple things, right? I think number one, 
I still look at, you know, the reason why I spent the first 15, 20 minutes today talking about valuing to Lorraine as a natural gas producer is because there is still that as a base for the business. And, you know, worst case scenario, they're profitable, right? There's a profitable company. This is not just a, a business plan on paper. Um, unlike, you know, again, I've compared it to, you know, next decade, which in, in full transparency, I also hold a position in, you know, but next decade, they don't really have any operations to, to speak of, right? If they can't, for whatever reason, get financing um, for, for the Rio Grande facility or, or you know, maybe some of their carbon capture stuff, which I think is, you know, much smaller and slower to start out, like they're toast, right? They're burning money. Tellurian is prop or I think is on the cusp of being profitable. I think they're going to be profitable in Q3, um, at least on an uh, at least on an EBITDA standpoint. Uh, maybe even have actual you know true net income. Um, so like that's that's you know the first thing I would say. But the second thing is in terms of you know what reason do we have to think terms of financing will happen in the next few years or so? Right. The like I say, I can make an argument either way. The obvious bear argument is well things have been seemingly a pretty good environment for the past six months and you didn't, it didn't get done. So, you know, yeah, things are not going to be better in the next two years, m most likely as far as we can tell. And so probably they won't get it done based off of that line of reasoning. I think on the flip side, um, you know, there's still the, the massive, you know, increase in, in gas prices in Europe, the massive need for energy over there, I think, and, and the, uh, you know, need for natural gas as a transition fuel for all of these countries that want to be moving towards renewables but you know they're not there yet they're not going to be there next year or the year after that or the year after that you know that just that macro picture is still the thing that drives um you know the the need for this and the need for you know all of the lng exports um you know facilities and expansions that have been happening and so you know the fact that that driftwood is you know, part of a larger company that is profitable is going to sort of make it more like a cockroach, something that, you know, is not going to just go away just because, ah, well, things fell through. It's not going to happen, right? No, they're going to keep trying. And they've got this, um, they've got this asset. They've already started construction, right? And I think that's, that would be my, um, uh, again, you can, you can say that that's kind of, uh, you know, a pretty optimistic point of view to say to like, I don't think it's a great counter to the bear argument, right? Let me just be clear. I think it's it's a fairly strong argument, right? Things were it was a great environment. They had a pretty good chunk of time. They had all the all the contracts in place, at least that they believed they needed. Again, I think there's been a lot of speculation that I have no direct insight into. I would I don't think that any any of us do um, in terms of how hard it is to actually finance those contracts. But you know they've had the contracts for for a good year, and you know they they expired at the point effectively. And now they're officially canceled, at least two of the three. But, you know, they weren't able to get it done. There's not really a great counter to that. They weren't, plain and simple. And I think a lot of people have lost faith and, and completely lost confidence. But again, I think because you know, the company's not going away, it's it, at this point, and again, this is this is my, you know, if you want to call my update investment thesis, it's not that, hey, I think we're going to be getting rich next year or this year even, um, as I was kind of hoping, or, you know, a couple months ago, I was thinking things were trending in that direction. But I think at this point, you, you need to look at it as, or sorry, not not giving advice. I'm looking at it as they're roughly fairly, fairly valued as a natural gas producer. They're expanding that footprint. So I think that value is going to grow at a you know modest pace. And then we have effectively, we've paid $0 or the market is pricing in a $0 valuation for Driftwood. So, you know, I would reverse it and say, you know, maybe if you think about it in terms of this is a low risk uh in terms of actual downside because if you have the the value of the gas production um a low risk way to get sort of a lottery ticket in terms of driftwood and then you sort of ask like what do you think really is the probability this is going to happen i mean i think management is going to be trying everything they can to make it happen and you know even if that means now they're going to be they realize they can't get it on all the terms that they wanted they're going to you know maybe give on some things. And so maybe it's not quite as profitable as we thought it was going to be. Maybe it's significantly less profitable as we thought it's going to be. But you know, what would that add to the company, right? Does that mean that the long term share price isn't ever going to go up to, you know, $100 per share? Maybe we have a cap at, you know, maybe we have a cap at $15 per share in, in phase one, right? And, we, and there's never any optionality for it to go up to $50 per share as we had when, when we were, you know, 
capturing a lot of the spread between JKM and Henry Hub. Who knows? Sorry, that was a long time. Let, let me hop back and, and see what's been on the chat. I see there's some other things um, on there. But th those are my initial thoughts. All right, uh, Brian says, great presentation, Dustin. Balance sheet looks great. It looks like stock is going to be moving with natural gas prices in the US. Yes, I agree 100%. Um, and just real quick to call that out, like if you look at a couple of these other folks, like you look at, um, you know, on their Friday, last Friday, what happened to a lot of these stocks, right? Natural gas didn't have a great day. Comstock Resources down. Antero Resource, you know, down 10% they were. Antero Resources down 8.5%. Um, you know, I mean, the, the market as a whole didn't do great, but you look at natural gas companies and, you know, they all went down, right? So all of a sudden, when you see a lot of companies in the sector, that, that I think are comparables to, you know, I could, I could pull up a couple more. They're all in like the seven to 10% range, I think, as far as going down, you know, Tellurian going down 15%, you put, puts that in perspective in terms of where it actually ended for the day. And you kind of think about it like, oh, well, sure. They had some bad news. That bad news of canceling these sales and purchase agreements was like chopping off just a tiny bit more of what is now a tiny sliver of the valuation of the company, which is driftwood, right? That in, in the overall, Hopefully you can see my, my hands in the overall, you know, valuation of Driftwood. I think it's, I think I would interpret this as the market was already saying, well, you know, 80, 90% of your value is from the gas production. The remainder is from Driftwood. Oh, Driftwood got canceled. Let's, you know, move that down a little bit in terms of how we're valuing that. So that's why you get sort of maybe this extra 5% on top of the 10% move that a lot of, you know, some other companies that are just natural gas producers had, um, so sorry, yeah, that that's me, um, sort of uh, editorializing things, but the, you know, it's kind of the way I see it. All right, the other thing you said was the way we knew Driftwood is out of the picture now. Um, yeah, Transient Stacker says I read something someone posted about the integrated model being dead, but their gas business is giving them money now. I saw that posted. Um, so that posted last night. I think it was kind of. It didn't make any sense to me. Like I, th I thought they were missing pieces. Sorry, I, I can't. Read. If, you, if you have a, a link, um, you know, I, I I take a look at that and give you my my opinion. Maybe it would jog my memory. But um, I, I did see that, and it, there was something about their their analysis was just like completely wrong. Um, I can't remember. Sorry. Uh, Greg says uh, I think they are going to partner with other natural gas providers and give them a bigger piece of the act, and they need to get FID done. I mean, I agree with you, right? Like that that would be the um. That would be the, that's the dream scenario, I think, for us at this point, right? Is that they, they go to a natural gas producer or you know, natural gas producer uh, would be good. And then, you know, they get talked to one of these folks and one of these folks says, you know, they, they solve the problem that Tolerian has, which is like now all of a sudden they're not contracted for, you know, everything or even a vast majority of phase one. They're contracted for a, a minority of phase one, right? They lost um, all of that. And again, this is, I think, fueling the speculation here is why did Tellurian cancel that second uh, sales and purchase agreement, right? It was stated explicitly in the uh, in the 8K that one of them was, let me open it up, right? I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, right? But they received the notice of termination from Shell, right, for the SPA. And um, the company delivered a terminate a notice of termination to VTOL. And, you know, you do have to ask yourself again, I, I know I'm going a bit off the topic today. I was hoping to have a whole nother stream. I have a couple of, you know, sort of wild theories on this stuff, but we could talk about some of it tonight. Um, you know, they delivered the notice of termination to VTOL and you just, I don't have a great answer on why that is, right? And I think this is a one, this is a credible theory that's been floating around that, you know, they needed to free up even more because somebody wants a bigger piece. And maybe, maybe not. It's it's really hard to say at this point. It's also hard to say if these are, you know, natural gas providers or if these are, you know, foreign sovereigns of some sort that want a piece of it. You know, there's some speculation there and it, it also makes sense. Um, you know, I think everybody sort of different parties are going to want different terms, right? Because they have a different uh, sort of different place in the uh, in the value chain, I guess you'd call it. And so, you know, it, it does have implications for, for the company. But again, we don't really know behind closed doors, you know, what conversation they have had with um, with who. And, you know, I, I still think 
of course, sorry, and I saw the next the next uh, comment I, I read ahead just a little bit. James DeSirio said, humble pie dish best served warm. Maybe this experience pitches him to the table. 100% agree, right? I think they, that, that was uh, Suki's video on Tuesday. You know, in, in retrospect of seeing we're no longer on schedule, I think the implication was, um, did I disconnect? So, tell me I disconnected. Hopefully y'all can, maybe somebody can can confirm that I'm still on here. Um Oh, I hope so. Can anybody still hear me? Oh man. Um oh. Is this reconnecting? What happened? Reconnection successful. Can anybody hear me? Did I cut out here? All right, Greg says I'm back in. Cool. So so somebody can hear me. Um Anyways, yeah, I think, uh, thank you. I'm still on. Uh, perfect. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry that I'm still new with this and I, it did disconnect. I don't know what happened. Um, yeah. Anyways, I, I was rambling a bit here about, you know, what could potentially be here. Um, what, what could potentially happen and who could potentially be the partner. We'll see. Um, cool. Cool. All right. Uh, sorry. I'm scrolling back up. Greg. Gendro, hopefully I got that right, says um, the price of natural gas uh, went from 10 to 7 in the last month. Yeah, it, w it went down. But again, it was also, you know, it's it's been up, right? So I agree it's off its, its peaks for sure. Um, you know, but the, the thing to remember is, right, that's always the sort of current best estimate, right? It is a 7, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to continue going down. Like, like that, that's my opinion. I don't really believe too much in sort of the momentum trading. Um, uh, but Maybe a little bit, but I think people do that. But I think at the same time, like in terms of being able to predict, is it going to continue going down, you know, massively and have a you know major trend? Like I don't, I don't buy into that personally so much. Um, anyways, uh, we'll see. And Greg says, "Is this a tell debacle or a genius chess game?" Yeah, that's the. So I, I, I think it's. I don't think it's a chess move, right? Like, I don't think they did all of this and had these terminated because they wanted to terminate them. If they wanted to terminate them, they they would have done both of these, right? And I think they probably would have uh, done this alongside some other PR or, or or maybe we'll see some other, you know, announcement made very, very quickly. But I, I don't think we would have seen sort of the video from come out on, on Tuesday explaining, basically saying like, well, you know, we're not on schedule, Um and, you know, and, and to see this press release here that says like, well, we're we're going back and we're talking to, um, you know, potential strategic partners that, uh, you know, th that we're now talking about. Right. Like this would not have been the update from the company that I would expect it if this was all sort of their part of their master plan. So I don't, I don't think this was intentional on on Tolerian's part at the same time. Um, you know, I think the real implication is again sort of what I alluded to earlier that they're probably not going to be able to capture, you know, the for for all of the output of Driftwood, they're probably not going to be able to index all of that to capture, you know, the spread between, you know, international indexes and Henry Huff, right? That was clearly their their strategy, their business, and, and that was part of what really interested me personally in Tellurian, why I had a I personally had a larger position in Tellurian than you know next decade. What made it uh, particularly interesting to me is you know that that spread could get very large in the future, right? As it is right now. And, you know, I think there's macro reasons to believe that spread could stay, you know, pretty large. And you, you could see, you know, they've alluded to it in the past. And I, I, I believe they're, you know, they being, you know, I, I guess mostly Suki in, in his videos uh, talking about the macro picture. I believe what he said there in terms of like, the spread is going to be persistent. It's going to be large, um, you know, maybe smaller sometimes, but it's generally going to be, you know, significant. And I think that was super interesting that Tellurian had those terms on effectively all of the output of Driftwood. I think the implication going forward is going to be they're not go they're not going to be capturing that spread um, on all of the output, maybe some, but certainly not all of it. And that's really probably what they were trying to keep uh, kind of as their as their core, uh, you know, constraint on any negotiations. And I think what they're they came to they came to a point where they realized this is, again, my speculation, but I think they came to that point where they realized that they're not going to be able to hold to those terms. Now they're going back to the drawing board, or not the drawing board, they're trying to sort of unwind that negotiating position and try to figure out, okay, what is our best strategy now to maximize our cash flows in the future if we can't actually do that? And so I think that remains to be seen. 
Um, but I think there's still, you know, I think they can still move forward with that. And so I think this goes back to exactly what, uh, you know, exactly what, what James said, you know, maybe this experience pushes the table. I think that is exactly the implication here. I think that they are going to be, um, they're going to give on that. And now they're going to be trying to, they're figuring out, okay, what's the best next best thing that we can do that people will actually accept, um, at the current moment. So, all right. All right. Uh, Cool. Wow. Lots of people, uh, lots of people who were, must've been, uh, lurking here when I, when I disconnected, all said, all uh, chimed in. That's great. I, this is awesome to see y'all here. I appreciate it. I, I, I think I, I love the streams probably, probably just as much, if not more than, than all of you. So, um, thank you. Thank you for joining. Greg says, did you see the full page ad for Tellurian and Friday's wall street journal? Um, I saw someone mention that there was the ad. I didn't, I didn't actually see the ad myself. Um, I mean, it, it does make me wonder who the heck they're advertising to, similar to that, uh, you know, th th there was that, uh, you know, commercial, the, the minute video, minute and a half video. And I thought that made a lot of sense. You know, I think it was Transient Stacker who said that, you know, that was probably made for events and that that makes sense, right? It probably made it for Gas Tech. Um, you know, we know that they were a big sponsor there. Um, but in terms of what they're advertising in the Wall Street Journal, like I... I don't know who they're advertising to there. Um, maybe one of you has a, has a better idea than me. Um, Transient Stacker says, could they make that spread on phase two? Yeah, so so I think that's that's a definite possibility, right? But the question is, um, is it maybe? So I think it's a possibility, but at the same time, um, you know, nobody's, I, I'm, I'm making a, a, some, I'm speculating here. I don't think anybody's going to want to sign a phase two contract to purchase from Tellurian uh, anytime soon. Right. I, I do think that by the time they are looking for expansions on, you know, on top of phase one, they're going to have a lot stronger of a negotiating position, right. They'll be able to be looking at a, I think a smaller check. I think phase, you know, the phase two is only like six uh, million tons per year. I, I guess it's probably, I think it's right in here. Um, uh, they used to have it in their presentation. They must've got rid of it. Um, I, I could look, but I, I think, uh, you know, phase two is smaller and they only, they have to convince a lot less people. And at that point, it'll probably be easier to get financing because they'll already have, you know, some operations or, or at least some, you know, a well-defined business model at that point. So yeah, I think they could at, on the, on the flip side, right. I think the market might be materially different in, in a couple of years where you might see people who already want those sorts of terms are going to get them from somebody else. Um, you know, th there's just a lot of unknowns in terms of like, if Tellurian still wants to do that, I'm sure they will. And I'm sure they'll be more likely to get it because of the factors I mentioned, but in terms of, you know, on the other side, you know, what are all the buyers going to get, right? If all the buyers are already getting it at Henry hub plus, you know, plus a, a fixed fee, because that's what they or plus a small percentage fee, you know, because that's what they think is, you know, most ad advantageous to them, like, there may not be anybody who's really, really wants those terms. Um, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, that That's a conversation to have again, I think, after they um, after they get phase one, you know, well underway. But it's certainly a possibility. And I think they they will have more flexibility in the future. And I mean, you see this with, you know, Chenier. And Chenier has been able to, Chenier and the, the other uh, existing LNG export facilities, right, when they're, it's a lot easier for them to get an expansion. And I, I think that's, you know, Again, just because they're already a, a solid company, it's much easier for them to get things going on. And they, you know, when they're smaller expansions, again, you have to convince a lot less people to take the terms that you are looking for. All right. Uh, and James says, yeah, why the marketing push will run burns? Yeah, I, I kind of already addressed that. Like, I don't know why they're they're doing that. And I mean, in, in retrospect, you know, I think they dumped a lot. Sure seemed like they dumped a lot of money into the gas tech event. Um you know, from some of the stuff that we saw and not super happy about that as an investor, you know, hopefully at the time I thought they were about to get, you know, up to a billion dollars in, in new cash come in and keep Driftwood on, on schedule and, and furthering, you know, that work. And, you know, at the time I wasn't, I wasn't particularly worried about it. And, you know, if I was reading between the lines, I would think that management also thought that too, you know, um, We'll see. 
uh we'll see if they continue you know spending a lot of marketing i would also imagine you know the wall street journal ad they probably paid for that a while ago and planned that a while ago so um i don't know but i'm, I'm guessing that's not something that happens just on a dime and they do it in you know in a day so we'll see uh brian says more lng exports from us will put pressure on henry hub prices yep us market will have to compete with lng exports as well yep that is bad for us but good for tell yeah and, and th that's the other thing it's sort of like a double-edged sword um at least it was sorry not double-edged it's sort of uh what do i want to say like they kind of benefited both ways on henry hub um at least while they had these contracts that were indexed to the international prices right because if you look at it from the perspective it, assuming while they had those sales and purchase agreements this was part of my investment thesis uh that is now weakened but if henry hub goes up tillery makes more on their existing gas production if henry hub goes down right that spread between the uh you know what they're actually able to get for their eventual lng exports is higher because their costs are lower and so they, they kind of had you know they were a little bit hedged right and that's that's the that's the massive benefit in the you know the integrated model so yeah i agree all right ladder says so do you think they will continue to drill wells even after potential driftwood completion so after driftwood completion i assume even if we're talking about phase one right like they didn't have a credible plan for getting enough resources to to um to get all of of the gas needed for phase one right they are going to have to either acquire more acreage acquire more resources from somebody or they're going to have to you know just plain and simple buy some of that gas and it's certainly a possibility right and i think that they're going to go one of two ways i think this might partially depend on um you know what terms they get on their new sales and purchase agreements right and uh you know I think at least the one thing that we can we can say is this management team is you know creative and strategic and that they're going to be looking at those as you know as a as part of a big picture rather than two pieces you know that are of the puzzle that are independent right and what i mean by that is you know they they really they've done this from the beginning right where they really wanted this integrated model in some form or fashion and they're looking at both you know having upstream production as a, as a major option for them and i think for them, it wouldn't surprise me if they said, okay, well, maybe we'll get some some of this index to Henry Hub if we can also if we can also be producing a lot of that ourselves and actually producing at a lower cost than Henry Hub to, to capture slightly more of that spread there. Um we'll see. But do I think they're gonna continue to, to, to drill wells even after a potential driftwood completion? Um again, I think that kind of my my guess is yes. Uh, one way or the other, but I, I would really want to see what the format is for their um, for their new sales of purchase agreements before I really uh, you know have a strong conviction of my answer there. All right, Beef says I think they are playing to a larger deal and they have someone in mind already. I sure hope so, right? Like again, it, it goes back to you know precisely what they said here, where it, it's all, this is fueling all the speculation, right? They delivered a notice of termination to Vital, you know, and we know they've been do, they we know they've been you know, shopping this stuff around. They've, they've been talking to people. They, they've certainly been active, right? We saw that when they were uh, amending the original notes or not the original, the, the, the most recent notes, right? Where they were changing the terms. They were going back to the original investor for the convertible notes and trying to, you know, change the terms there so that, you know, so that they could sort of work out a deal, right? And so this management is, is being very active and I'm sure like, from the outside, it seems like they had no plan B, but I, I have to imagine they they had, you know, they have a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, you know, lined up and plan A didn't work out. And so they're going to go to work working on, you know, plan B. And I, I sort of, I think I joked in, in the discord that like, you know, they're way past plan B at this point because, you know, plan A was give us money to fund Driftwood and you can take some of the, take some of the LNG for yourself and, and you know, at cost, um, you know, that was what they were shipping or, or shopping around, in, you know, 2018 timeframe. Um, sorry, I need to drink a water real quick. <sighs> but yeah, I, I hope they have someone already in mind. I, I have to imagine they've already been having those conversations. Um, you know, now they're going back and saying, all right, well, you know, you kind of wanted that deal. Well, we're, we're more willing to work with you here. We'll, we'll throw this in and, you know, we'll see. I mean, and this sort of goes up to the question above of like, you know, could they make the spread on phase two? 
Like, I think, I think on some level, it's going to be super, super um, useful for the company to just, you know, maybe take worse terms for phase one and take the long term view to say, you know, all right, phase one is still only, you know, less than half of the overall Driftwood project. So, you know, maybe we can, maybe we're not capturing all of the, the profit that we wanted on, on the whole facility, but, you know, we still have, you, know, you can negotiate harder on, you know, phase two, phase three, phase four, um, you know, make a deal sooner now to, to get phase one locked down. All right, Greg says, do you think the price of Tell moves in junction with the price of Henry Hub? I think it's going to going forward. Um, that's my, again, not financial advice. I, I, as I like to, you know, call out often, you know, making predictions is hard, uh, especially when it's about the future. Um, you know, that that's a Yogi Berra quote, I think. And I can't say for sure, but I think in the, sorry, let, let me qualify that. I think in the absence of material news, it starts to give us more and more confidence that Driftwood is going to move forward anytime soon. Um, yeah, I, that's, I, I do think that Tellurian is going to be valued like a natural gas producer and that's, that's going to move with the price of Henry Hub pretty strongly. All right. Oh, wow. This has almost been an hour. I'm going to have to pop off soon. Um, but let me, uh, at least finish up with what I got on the chat here. Transient Stacker says, did you see the Bloomberg article about Britain wanting a long-term LNG deal? I saw the headline. I haven't actually, um, got to read the article. Sorry. I was... I was honestly uh, out of town all weekend and didn't get to follow a lot of stuff. We were camping, so I haven't gotten to follow everything uh, recently, but I did see that there was a headline. And yeah, that's what I said earlier is that, you know, I think there's gas producers make sense. I think there's also foreign foreign countries that, that make sense, right? Europe being the prime, prime example there where I, I know it's a little bit, it's not quite as soon as I think they'd all want the energy, but, you know, that's one way to lock down a lot of energy for, for the future. Um, for these comp countries and then it sort of at least partitions the problem right if, if i'm if i'm a european country and i'm looking at um you know getting energy independence and actually you know getting not energy independence sorry independence from russia i should say and uh locking down a supply of energy really for my for my country um you know this is a long-term problem it's not just now it's not even just next year presumably because even if russia turns the gas back on you don't want to give them the option to turn it back off whenever they want, right? You want to be diversified. And that's not a that's not a quick thing that you can just do when every other country in Europe wants to do the same thing at the same time. So I have to think that the, so somebody, you know, thinking long term and thinking strategically is going to say, OK, well, sure, I can't contract with any company that has spare LNG capacity because it's all full and they got to build a new facility that takes, you know, four years. But at least if I contracted for those volumes starting four years from now, now it limits the scope of the problem I have to solve. It limits it to just, okay, I've got it solved for four years from now. Now I just need to focus on the next four years, right? What can we do to get some amount of energy for the next four years? And that's, you know, that's a slightly more solvable problem. And that, you know, I think for those countries is, um, you know, that's how I would be thinking about it. Again, I'm most certainly not in their position. Um, you know, it's a very, very complex situation, but I think that, I think it makes sense. All right. Uh, Ron B says, financing this project is probably the easiest thing I've done in my career. Suki, it doesn't make sense to be a conference of the speakers and sponsors and not be confident in getting a deal done. The best deal, probably not, but enough to get it built is my bet. Go back to early videos, how much Florian would retain of the business when natural gas, LNG arbitrage was minimal. Yes. Um, agree a hundred percent. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, I know a lot of people are super frustrated that he said that, right. That he said that. And now we look at what's actually happened and, you know, there's a lot, I, I read people on the internet who think, um, you know, who think he, who's just lying or straight up lying and that he's a total con man. And I, it's hard for me. Like, I just don't think that that's the case. Right. And I don't think that because I think Suki, you know, I don't know him personally. I, and I don't say that because I think, you know, he's doing any of this out of the goodness out of his heart. Um, you know, he owns a bunch of the company. His buddies, you know, his friends, or at least his co-workers, I assume they're his friends to some degree, you know, people we've worked with, uh, you know, for years and years, because a lot of those folks came over from uh, Chenier, you know, they own a big part of the company, right? And this is kind of his baby. This is his way to give the middle finger to Carl Icahn, right? He wants this to be successful. Um, yeah, again, not the least of which is because I'm sure he wants, he wants a big pile of money because he owns a bunch of the, of the, of the company. And yeah, I think... 
I don't think he would be out there saying things like that if it wasn't, you know, roughly true. He, I, I believe he exaggerates to some degree, but I, I think that, uh, you know, at least earlier this year, I believe that that's pro- that was probably true. Um, all right, let me get through the the rest of the chat. But so, sorry, just just to close on that, Ron. Um, I agree, and and I think you know you can even go back to the earlier days of the company when they were looking at this model, and you know. They're sorry that they weren't not necessarily this model, but they were looking at basically not capturing the profit from all of the offtake, right? Where they were actually having some other folks buy into the pay the equity, like right, buy into um, Driftwood itself, right? Give a big pile of money to help fund it, and then in exchange, those folks get it at cost, right? So they can do with it whatever they want. You know, that was the original model in 2018, 2019 timeframe before they pivoted to what they're doing now uh, or, or were doing, you know, before Friday, let's say. Um, and, you know, that uh, they weren't capturing all of the upside there, right? What they were getting was there was some volume that was set aside that wasn't going to be contracting. Those folks were putting enough money that Tellurian got to keep a good enough chunk and they could just sell that, you know, um, and it is interesting that they've had these different deals and, and, you know, how much of it they get to retain. And I think you you are going to see, you know, something that's going to be probably, as I said, and as you said, drift, you know, Driftwood um, being more owned by someone else. But again, getting phase one going is going to be beneficial, I think. So Greg says, uh, thank you for giving us full hour of content. A- absolutely. Um, thank you for, for hopping on the stream. I think you all have had some excellent questions, excellent comments. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, I, I I love it's so much more fun for me when when there's a bunch of people on here, um, uh, having a great chat. Brian says thanks a ton, Dustin. Great presentation on a global basis. Love it, love it. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, all right, Ron B. Last last comment that I see here says one nineteen twenty twenty one one hundred billion dollar platform twenty five billion to build. TTF six dollars. JKM nine dollars. Hunter have three dollars. Retain forty percent of one hundred billion dollar platform equals twenty third dollar billion valuation. Yep. Um, yeah. And and that's even just the the sort of the asset value, right? I think they were trying to if I recall correctly, that's when they were they were coming out and saying like, well, when when we FID this sort of implies this future value just based on um value of the stock just based on the book value of the assets, you know, so yeah. I mean, I think to be fair, even at that point, they even though we're only capturing, as you said, they're only forty percent of the the overall project they were going to capture, and I, I couldn't remember what the percent was. So, th- th- thank you for that. I think that's exactly what I was uh, alluding to to their earlier model. Um, you know, even back then, they believed that the spread was kind of like a floor, right? That they, if you if you heard them talk about this, they thought that you know the JKM to Henry Hub, you know, spread was what it was today, and that it was probably never going to go lower than that. Um, and that it might grow and be, be larger. So that, uh, I, I think they are still going to want to keep some of that optionality in and, you know, if I'm giving my speculation, you know, I think the, the existing sales of purchase agreement with, with Gunvor, maybe they'll keep that one around, right? Maybe they'll still have 3 uh, million tons per year that are indexed to those, um, international indexes and they can still capture that spread. All right. And Greg says, see you next time. Yep. Um, thank you. And yeah, I am going to hop off. This has been uh, almost an hour, my absolutely my longest stream by uh, I think even 20 minutes or so. So thank you everyone for for hopping on. This is a great chat. Um, I appreciate it. And yeah, I, uh, I will see y'all next time. Have a good one.